For those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Roger Raven. I'm the, the Dean of the Faculty of Business and Management. Um, and uh, we were, as part of the senior management team, uh, we had the opportunity and the privilege of having a presentation on Monday um, uh, from Niall and his team. And what came out of that meeting was what is normally an extremely vocal senior management team who talk an awful lot and have the capacity to argue an awful lot were actually, when we got to the end of Niall's presentation, were absolutely silent. And when the Vice Chancellor said, are there any questions, the only thing which anybody could say was, that was just inspirational. So that's how I'd like to introduce Niall today, to say thank you very much for an inspirational talk on Monday. And thanks for the privilege of me coming and joining you and your team um, today to give a, a presentation this afternoon. And thank you very much. Much appreciated. Um, <clears throat> My name is Niall Mellon, which I don't expect to mean, will mean anything to any of you, um, but I'm going to give you a little bit of background uh, to what I've been doing um, with my housing charity and now education charity in South Africa, and maybe to help you form a full picture of uh, my background, I'll, I'll give you just a couple of minutes on um, some business things I've done, one or two that might fit into uh, um, maybe your own journeys in the future. And and, and then, if it doesn't seem too cheeky, literally one or two slides at the end with a few tips on perhaps a bit of, you know, uh, a few tips on what qualities or routes that might help to make you successful in the future. Could I just, before I start, just to get a little understanding of uh, my audience, ask any people involved in business related courses to put your hands up? There's only one person, two people, three. Four, five, six, seven, okay, maybe ten. And, and then could I ask people involved in the humanities and arts and, and that end to put your hands up? Another section. And design and, and creative led courses? Okay, I think I, I understand uh, um, my audience a little better. Um, could I also take this opportunity? You may not have realized that um, our vice chancellor has walked in, or is he, where is he hiding down the room? At the very back of uh, the room here is, uh, you'll know your vice chancellor, who I've had a great privilege of spending the last two or three days with him and with the senior members of your entire uh, university group. And that has been an exceptional privilege for me. I've learned much, much from those meetings in the last few days, and I'm very grateful that a man and a team of people who have so much on have spared so much time, and thank you for that, Madam. Um, okay, I better, better get going. Um, my name is Niall Mellon. Uh, the, the main principle I'm here today is to talk to you about education, and in particular, uh, a, a quotation that some of you will recognize that Nelson Mandela said, that education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. My journey began um, in 2002, 12 years ago in South Africa. I was with my girlfriend, and who's now my wife, and we went on a holiday to Cape Town. When we got off the plane, I was absolutely horrified at the sight of tens of thousands of shacks on the sides of the motorway. And we drove into town and we rented a, a luxury villa there for a few weeks and there was a, an African chap looking after the house and I couldn't get this image of shacks out of my mind. I had been disturbed by what I'd seen on the drive into town and I asked him to bring me to the nearest township to this luxury location we were staying in. He said to me initially that there was a few townships 20 minutes or a half an hour away that possibly I could go to, but that most townships really weren't safe enough for a tourist like me to, to go into at that time. And I asked him, where is the nearest township, physically the one that nearest, is nearest to this house? And he brought me to a township that was less than five minutes drive. I think it was literally three or four minutes down the road. And, and there, it may have only been three or four minutes, but it was perhaps two or three hundred years different in terms of the lifestyle these people were living. Um, running water, open sewers, um, and, and shacks that averaged three meters by three meters. I was horrified to see people living in these conditions. Um, 
I discovered very quickly one of the biggest fears people have living in townships is fire, that their homes are made primarily out of timber and rusted metal, but they're all very close to each other. So if one goes on fire, often 50 or 100 or 500 shacks burn at the same time. It was explained to me that a lot of the people, and I could see it in their shacks, had heavy duty fertilizer bags. And they were used in the middle of the night, being woken up by the intense heat of fires and having to pack in a few seconds their entire belongings into this bag and then to try and escape down the hill or across a field as the fires and flames were moving fast. Um, one of the big, uh, one of the most disturbing images was seeing the remnants of a fire burned shack and the rusted metal and burnt metal and realizing that the people had no choice but the following day to come back and, and rebuild a home out of whatever charred remains remained. Um, so this was the scene that uh, that greeted us and and one of the big disturbing things was that there was not the hostility that had been uh, described to me by my friend in that villa. Instead, there was a warm hello and a welcome and a curiosity. Was I from, was I from Britain or Ireland? When I said Ireland, uh, one person asked me, did I know Roy Keane? And, and that surprised me that, that there they were in such poverty and yet in other parts of uh, their lives they were aware of, uh, you know, at that time, uh, talented soccer players on our side of the globe. So I decided to do something about this. I had enjoyed a, some degree of success as a, um, a self-made entrepreneur and I had always dreamed of trying to do something meaningful with my success if I ever did achieve success. And the first thing I asked this community was how I could help and they assembled a group similar in size to what I see before me here in this room of, of students who had qualified for college but who were unlikely ever to get to college because of the then fee structure and the obstacles to education. So I ended up with uh, Nicola, my, my girlfriend at that time, um, uh, agreeing to sponsor a number of young people through university degrees. But very soon we sat down a few weeks later to discuss housing. And, and we gathered together the community leaders and they in turn brought people from the community the following day. And I was ill prepared for the crowd when I returned the next day. There were hundreds and hundreds of people and somebody had put a few um, pallets, the old timber pallets on top of each other and I had to stand in front of a crowd of hundreds of people to explain what we were going to do. And, and really, at that point, if you imagine, I had only come on holiday, I didn't know the country, and I really was drawing on whatever experiences I could uh, think of that would help me to do what I wanted to do correctly. The first thing I said to these people was that they were going to become the success for all of South Africa to see, that I believed the solution to housing and solving it lied within each township. So I made a pledge that I would do my best not to employ anybody other than people who lived in that township. That was my first thing. The second thing was I had a successful business in the UK. I was building in construction in a, a number of cities and I went back to my management team and explained I was changing my lifestyle a bit and I'd only be available week on, week off. So for me to get to know my new business, as I was calling it in my head, um, I, I wanted to get to know it from the ground up. So for three years, I, I worked week on, week off, where I'd come back to the UK here for my profitable businesses and go back the following week. And this was really to ingratiate me, not just with the community, but the whole culture of um, this new area that I was in. So we, we, I announced and showed them a picture of a house and I pledged that we would take communities like this and we would change them from this to this. And these are the houses that, that we, we've built. You can imagine living in one of those shacks, what this house meant to you. Every family had a story of the terror and the horror of living in a shack. Some, I, I remember walking into one particular shack and seeing a really handsome young teenager, maybe 12 or 13, and I was looking at him from this side, and then as, as, as he turned around, I, I saw how one night his face had melted in the flames, that they, they, he had run in the wrong direction as the flames from another nearby shack had trapped everything. 
I met other families who had told me of, um, I, 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 well, of, of there's so many different stories, but, but let's just say really, really upsetting stories about um, death and poverty that they had endured living in these conditions. Um, the charity that I founded in 2002 has now completed over 25,000 homes. We have built homes for 125,000 people. And most importantly, and probably the, the main reason I'm here today, is that we have achieved this only through people and audiences like you guys and girls here in front of me standing up and saying, I'm going to give you a couple of days of my life. And over 20,000 people in the past 12 years have made possible our incredible success in turning around the lives for so many people. They say that you know, those that give receive much more back. And, and I can truly say that having listened to the stories of over 20,000 people who have now volunteered with me, that, that you certainly will receive back so much more if you simply can stretch your thinking to think outside of the box in your own comfort zones and consider becoming a volunteer with our program. Um, along our journey, I recognized the importance of getting awards for what we were doing simply to establish credibility. And, and in your future journeys, wherever that takes you, where you're trying to express yourself to a future employer or a future company or indeed a bank manager to get them to lend to you, perhaps for those of you who form your own business, I realized it's very important to have peer endorsements that, that if nothing else, they say that other people have judged you to be head and shoulders above your peers in some category. Um, my focus, I mean, just go back up a little bit, Jill. My focus has been on quality. At that time in South Africa, there was no standard really for these types of government supported houses. The state housing policy was giving about $1,000 per family, and we were donating another $10,000. And my mission over the past 12 years has been to um, inspire courage and motivate South Africa to increase her budget to, to a level where we could build a house without needing donors. That took about eight years. And the different tools that I used to achieve that were a combination of professional reports. It, it may look blatantly obvious to point out that going from a shack to a house has numerous benefits for the, the family's health, for, for the well-being of the family, and indeed for their own self-esteem and believing that they can achieve more. So these things looked obvious to me, but I found I was hitting a wall. And without the right type of professionally written reports, you know, it was harder for me to, uh, to, to win my argument that it was in the nation's interest to increase the money. I also learned of the power of popular culture and popular volunteerism. Perhaps all of us in the room do something throughout our year, even if it's as little as a few coins. And some of you will do more than that, giving your time to help various charities. But what I did realize that my own formula in, in having my volunteer trip on one week every year allowed me to have maximum impact for housing in South Africa. So that first year where I recruited volunteers, I had 150 came from Britain and Ireland. And the next year went to 300, 700, 1400, 2000 even in 2008. And, and we had 2000 people came from the UK and Ireland in one week in, in 2008. And our mission was to get all 2000 working in their allocated job in under 60 minutes. We made it by about 10 seconds to spare. Um, but the visible impact of 2,000 foreigners coming to South Africa played an enormous part in influencing South Africa to do more herself. And, and, and that, I think, is a critical journey that all of you, perhaps, um, when you're gathering together, be it for business or for charity, some initiative, a lot more can be achieved if you come together as an organized unit. Um, Sometimes when you look at where we're at now, you might say to yourselves, well, where do I start to achieve something like this? And, and what I'm going to try and I hope communicate today is 
you don't have to be anything particularly special. Um, I'm probably uh, the least intelligent person in this room. I didn't, I didn't achieve good enough results really to, to get me to college. So, so every one of you have a head start over me in terms of your ability. And, and perhaps what I did do was I wasn't afraid to make the very first step and in so much of what we do in our lives, we probably don't admit it to ourselves, but confidence is a big part of it because people very quickly say it's risk and that person's a risk taker and that's why they achieved. But I'm, I'm not fully convinced of that. I, I, I think a lot of it is our own, our own interpretation of the obstacles that lie in front of us. What is risk to one person is no risk to another person. And often what has propelled me forward is I've looked at somebody who's very, successful in a particular field and I've sort of evaluated could I could I if I had 10 years experience or 20 like that person has could I be as good as that person and 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 I think when you do come to your own decisions where you're finding yourself a little afraid or a little lacking in confidence to really just take that first step when when we started South Africa had 10 million people, 10 million living in shacks. And I lost count for the first three or four years of everybody making well-meaning comments. And, and they were all well-meaning, but so many people said to me, no, they're never going to solve this problem. Look, it's just so big. And my view was, well, fair enough, perhaps we might never solve this problem, but, but we are certainly solving it for the one family we're helping today and the next family tomorrow and the next family after that. Um, we were, very, um, we were very pleased in 2009, I think it was, when President Obama um, passed legislation for the Nile Mellon Trust. And again, if I just probe into that a little deeper, um, I can truly say I had almost no contacts in America. I had to start with a very short list of a couple of names and, and I found one person who knew one person in Congress and from that tiny little door opening um, uh, I, I ended up having, having meetings with maybe 50, 60, 80 politicians over 18 months and by the time President Obama um, was elected for his first term um, I had both sides of the House and Congress had agreed to support me with legislation coming directly um, from Congress. Um, one of the, one of the quirks in the US aid system was when we went to go and meet them, we presented in detail all our financials and our methodology and the directors of US aid stood up and cheered and said they had never seen a more efficient housing charity anywhere. And then they sat down crestfallen and told me that they couldn't help us because they were mandated only to provide money for permanent housing. And they said, now the, the, the tragedy is that if you want money for those people who've lost their houses in a fire, we could probably give you $25,000 for a tent. But we can't give you money for a permanent structure. And I said to them, well, how can I change that? And they said, you won't be able to change it unless you get the legislation changed. So at that moment, it looked daunting. But again, if you just start with something and you build the right teamwork and people around you, and you know how to ask the right questions. I mean, I'm very good at probing. And I would say to somebody, like, I know you think you don't know somebody, but let's just look at this. Does you know Sheila, and Sheila knows Betty, and Betty knows Gertrude. And eventually, you can work your way to perhaps somebody who does have the, the networking or the relationship with uh, somebody to help you. Um, Volunteerism, as you probably gathered at this stage, is a huge part of what we've done. Um, I, I used to hire a PR agency in South Africa each year. My volunteers arrived and their mission was to get housing on the front page of as many newspapers as we could, to get me onto radio and to get us onto television. And, and I've been explaining to some of the gifted people I've met in your university over the last few days that um, I very quickly saw the integrity of the South African government and the sincerity of decent human beings who are now in charge of their country. And, but I also saw how, how fragile they were to, to criticism. They were doing their best and it's a little bit like some, we're all trying to do our best and then somebody telling, listen, you're doing what you're doing is rubbish, you've made no difference whatsoever. And I saw people who were worn out with effort. So I decided my policy would be never to criticize South Africa publicly. 
Um, I could see much quicker solutions and a much quicker roadmap to solving this crisis, but I also saw that that would really block off my new friends from me, that they would get defensive. So I went to them, I spoke about it, and I said, look, if occasionally I have a couple of good ideas, would you be okay with me talking to you about them privately? But rest assured, I'm a friend of South Africa, and when you see me on the media, you'll see me praising the effort that you're doing. So that wasn't as easy as I'm making it sound, because I got very frustrated with bottlenecks in the system and procedures that could be could be changed and you, you have to take a view that maybe for three or four years you just sign up to that and you stay with it and don't revisit your decision making because so many of us, you know, fundamentally I always stick to my instinct and if I make a decision, I, I, I occasionally we all have to revisit some decisions but by and large if I believe I'm right with my decision, I make sure I've gone through quite a period of time before I reassess that. Um, and what we did with, with the large-scale volunteerism, we used that week every year to change policy. And it wasn't just with the media, because the media is only an expression of something. So I looked down the food chain of people who are influencers South Africa is divided into nine provinces, so we looked at the heads of housing in all provinces. And then I'd say to my team, well that head might leave in three years, so bring the deputy and bring another two or three, bring the heads of departments because they are going to eventually take over. So we had, on, on I think that particular trip I had 2,000 people, and but that week I had 50 of South Africa's top housing people and we brought them down, we flew them from all over the country, and they were, they left massively inspired. And also, so many of them said, you know, we're facing an endless challenge here in housing, and just this week has made us feel 10 foot tall to see that people on the other side of the world care about our problem here. And something just as little as that can, can boost, uh, boost people who face overwhelming challenges. Um, I'm very pleased to say to you, and it's no coincidence we, we, that, that um, we have these pictures, that from the very start, 10 years ago, quietly one of our key teams every year has been people from Swansea. And, 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 and I hope today, and building on an incredible last few days with the university, that our engagement is going to become hopefully much bigger. Some of you recognize, uh, well, they're a bit out of your age group now for most of you, but they're all local, local Swansea people. Over the last couple of days, me being, you know, I suppose essentially now from South Africa, even though I'm sure you can hear my Gaelic brogue, um, uh, but people are, uh, have been asking me about Nelson Mandela and, and um, I was very lucky to, to, uh, to meet him. Um, uh, I'm not sure which stories to sort of convey, but I mean, maybe that particular picture. <coughs> um, we, were, we were invited, um, that was my firstborn son, and, and we were invited up to his house to, to, uh, for Mediba to, to meet my little boy Harry. And, and, and I remember, um, I think it was before that, now my dates get a bit mixed up now, but I'm, I'm, I think it was maybe a year before that, Mandela came, came over to Ireland to open the Special Olympics. And I got a call on a Saturday morning, I remember being in bed, and it was from Mandela's top person to, to ask me now, can you do us a favour, Madiba's going for a photograph with the athletes, is there any chance you can buy him a pair of nine uh, runners, trainers? And Mandela was always about going that extra 10%, and that's something that I sort of, I may only do an extra 1%, but I, I subscribe all the time to that, just doing something a little bit extra that stands you out from the crowd. And here was Mandela, who already, already was the most powerful, influential statesman in the world. But that wasn't enough for him going taking a picture. He wanted to show them how connected he was with sport. So I got a call to go and buy him a pair of runners on a Saturday morning, which we duly brought down to him. So sometime later when I went up to his house, I remember thinking about that and deciding what would I wear. And as you can see, I'm in a t-shirt. So I talked it over with, that's Nicola, my wife there, and I said, well, look, I'm happiest actually in casual clothes. And, and then people would say to me, no, I'll get a picture with a suit and tie because, you know, it'll look so much more impressive with them. And I weighed it all up and I said, no, I'm going to go as I am. And my charity logo is on my, my t-shirt. And, and, 
And, uh, and then our conversation drifted and Mandela was talking to me about the charity and each time he'd look at me, even though he knew I'm here because I was there because he respected what I was tr trying to do on, on, in his country for his people, but, but seeing the message of my charity kept bringing him back to this subject because he was, our conversation was covering a lot of things. I, I was talking last night and about some of the other meetings we had with him. Um, one very special occasion was in a, a mutual friend's house and in fact I think this was the first time I, I met him and we were invited to a house for Sunday lunch and we were on the number two table where we were happy to be um, but it was in a small room so the conversation was moving between the tables and at the end of that meeting I remember one astute person, we all got to ask a question or two to him and one person, he was 85 at this point, he would go on to live another 10 years, but somebody asked him, Mr. Mandela, how would you like to be remembered? And Mandela was sitting down, he thought about this and then he stood up, you know, and, and a lot of the people in this little group were people who'd known him for 40 or 50 years and I think I was sitting with the man who'd written his autobiography and these people had known him a long time, so I think he he took an above average moment to, to ponder this. So he, he said that well, Julius Caesar was remembered as a man of war and Napoleon was remembered as a great general. I want to be remembered as a man of peace. And that was it. And in that moment, because I watched when he died, people describing everything, but that summed up exactly how he wants to be remembered. I remember asking him, uh, I remember asking him about why he didn't break out of prison. You know, in fact, that, that day, I think, that, that was that conversation, and Mandela said to me that we could have broken out. All I had, would have had to do is raise my hand, but millions would have been slaughtered. Millions. And he said, I knew that the walls of apartheid were falling, and if it was to take another 10 years, and that meant 10 million people not being killed, well, I was willing to take that time. Um, one person I met through him, and this is unfortunately just a generic picture, um, similar age. Uh, I ended up recalling this story last evening, so we found a picture today too. So it's not this person, but one time I met him and he said to this the guy was about 20 or 22 and he said, you tell, you tell Niall your story. And, and this boy said to me when I was 13 or 14, my, um, from Rwanda, um, during the Hutu Tutsi um, genocide, um, they attacked our village and my mother and father and uh, four brothers and sisters, I think it was four, were all killed in front of me. And uh, I went to the elder in my village and I asked him what to do. And the elder told me, if I can get to South Africa, I'll be safe, that Nelson Mandela has just been made president. And that, 13 or 14 year old boy um, walked and I'm sure hitched a lift and, and trains, but, but just the simple belief of what Mandela meant uh, inspired that boy to make it across five countries and two years of effort to get to South Africa. Um, I was talking with uh, your incredible Vice Chancellor today about the little things that have worked for me and my charity and, and one of the things is when you arrive out with us for your one week experience you're given a list, of, a whole clothing just for you if you're small, medium or large and you get t-shirts and anorex and a kit bag and stuff and, and when I had the very first trip I had 150 people came out and the second year and third year it grew, grew to 300 and 700 and I decided that I would do a stripe for every single year you come out with us and those stripes became a real symbol of pride and of experience and, and in the natural I think it's, I don't know if it's competition, but maybe it is that exists between all of us as people that it really inspired people to come out more and more because you'd get to four stripes and you know that five stripes, there's only six people or 10 people have them. And, and, and now 10 years la later, I, I probably out of 20,000, I probably only have about maybe 20 people or less even who've made it, but it was a real magnet for encouraging people back and it meant that if you come out at me next year, as hopefully some of you will, you'll just find yourself wanting to come back as a veteran and get a second or third stripe. Um, 
South Africa has now increased her budget over those eight years and, and some of the little things we did I think helped with that. When she won the World Cup in 2006, the right to host it in 2010 or maybe it was 2007, um, I again went back to an advertising agency and I said design up a whole scheme and let's look at how we can make more out of this World Cup. And, and, and then I did a, um, a report for South Africa. I went to meet the Minister of Housing and I showed her that South Africa faces um, a potential backlash here to the World Cup. That if, if many people come to South Africa and everyone's going to know you're spending a billion dollars or two billion dollars on hosting the World Cup, they're going to feel that that's uh, wrong when you have 10 million people living in housing. So long and short, um, I'm sure perhaps the government would have worked this out anyway, but I certainly gave them my few minutes on it. And South Africa increased her budget massively um, uh, out of a fear that the World Cup could be, could be a backlash. So the end result now, to a combination of reasons, is we have now uh, uh, the government are paying um, $11,000 for these houses for every single person in the country who's living in a shack. And while we have housed 125,000, there are another 2 million people living in Nile Mellon houses built by other contractors around the country. So I looked at the crossroads of where I was in, in um, 2012 when we hit that, that uh, our, our target and the government were now putting up all of the money. And I asked myself, do I close up my charity or do I continue and use the, the knowledge we've learned? And, and, and it's not always a 99, 1% decision. You know, in order to achieve this, I've, I've now, done 12 years of weekly commuting almost every week to South Africa and, and I have children in Ireland and I have other pressures that, that uh, you know, maybe, maybe are pulling me in a different direction. And, but I, you know, maybe 51 to 49, I decided to continue simply because I, I remember a very poor child I met one time and, and I met her mother with her and, and we gave some help to this family in, in a medical, they needed some medical help in a particular thing and, and, and when I had finished it all and you know the mother came to say thanks and I said oh, it was no big deal, look I'm really happy just to have helped you guys and she said to me a line that I've never forgotten that if you didn't come there's nobody else coming. And I thought about that for children I've met in the Congo and Kenya and the poorest slums in the world where I have seen and sat with families who've had to knowingly sell some of their children into slavery and into, um, into the sex slave because they physically are starving. We've just built some schools, I'm going to show you in a moment, up in Kenya. And I have sat with our children in those schools while they go, while they've been on rubbish dumps, licking the inside of um, yogurt cans and tins of beans just to get crumbs of sustenance to keep them alive. So, so this weighed on me and, and, and then I thought, well, education is out of my space. But if I can meet people who know a lot more about education, then I know I can assemble teams. And maybe then, what if it turns out that we can have another great success? So this is our new target now. It's to provide educational improvements for over 100,000 of the world's poorest children. But I need each of you to understand that you are all important to me, that every single person makes a huge difference. We had 20,000 volunteers, 20,000, and we built one and a quarter houses for every volunteer who came. Um, we went up to Nairobi last year. Mandela, that time he introduced me to that young boy, for a young man from Rwanda. Mandela wasn't just about a border in South Africa. He really wanted to see any person who needs help get help. And as I'm trying to convey to you today to think outside of the boundaries of this great country and think of poor people you haven't met, I'm really just subscribing to the same philosophy that Mandela lived himself. So we decided this time round we would do a little bit of effort in other African countries. We went into a very, very poor slum in Makuru in, in Nairobi and we cleared a field and 20 weeks later, after them waiting perhaps 30 years, 20 weeks later, we handed over a 1500 um, classroom pupil school. Um, we then started construction on a second school. That's not a great picture of it, but it's a big school uh, for 2,200 pupils. 
Um, and, and, and we've just started another one now in Cape Town, where, where housing last time round was the key focus and quality of housing. I quickly you know, began to see that it's not just schools. We need help from educational professionals to help these developing countries to have a better system of education. And we designed a program that would be initially making the, the conditions conducive to lending by filling in the, the, the holes in the roof when it rains and fixing broken windows or bad walls. So just minor infrastructure changes. And then we, we were, we're still in a constructive phase of designing our overall program, but the essential principle was that we've met lots and lots of willing principals. Most of them are very willing to learn, but they simply have never been trained in how to be a principal. We have met already hundreds of teachers, very willing to learn, who've never really been trained properly to be a teacher in their specific subject. Some of the maths teachers are achieving a pass rate of zero. Some of the English teachers are achieving pass rates of 5% in their class. So already those of you who are clearly fluent in English and have no doubt at all quite good at maths, simply coming for a week or two, sitting with a number of kids in a structured format, you're going to be the foundation for those children to get them into a starting process. Um, I'll just go back a tiny bit, Jill. Um, and, and in these schools, we're, we're doing an overall plan where we're not just about assisting the principal, but we're, we're, we're training the teachers so that within two years, when we leave these schools, we want these schools to have a pass rate of 75% sustainable. And what I mean by that is when we've left, we have equipped the school, with, i.e. the teachers and principal, with the skill set to achieve this on their own. And for me as a business person, I'm a very specific target-driven person. And a lot of programs perhaps you know, are of a, a great value, but if you can measure your, your success by a barometer, it's a much easier target to, to, to hit if you've made a target. This is uh, our first school in South Africa, and we're only on board there three or four months in a proper way. But that school, last year, they had an 18% pass rate in fifth grade maths. They're already at 50% in literally only uh, a, couple, a couple of months of effort. And, um, and English, they've gone from 46% to 71%. Um, when Mandela died, I... Um, I wanted to do something to just mark his passing as our, our gift for what he's done for all of us in the world. And, and I had been up to his home village and one of the things I most admired about him was he never favoured out his own village for special treatment. So there in his village were some of the worst schools in all of South Africa and that was a measure. It may look unfair to the local people who thought he would help them, but in the bigger scheme of things I think it says what a great statesman he was. So we've announced we're going to build a couple of schools there and um, this November in a month's time I have, uh, in fact under a month, three weeks from now I have 200 volunteers coming and we're going to complete classrooms for over a thousand children in those seven days. Um, over the last couple of days I've had truly a, an immense privileged uh, time with your Vice-Chancellor, with your Pro-Chancellors, with the Deans of most of your faculties and, and, and I've listened across the table to their knowledge, experience and, and, um, and ability. And, and all of our conversations came back to, to volunteerism. We know there's a lot of you in this college who are doing different things and very good work. But perhaps if we, if we all came together as a group of students, imagine if we had one trip in a year's time and let's dream to think that we might have 100 students come out in one week or 200. Not only would you be helping the poorest children in this world that would be in awe of your arrival, um, but you would come back then as ambassadors for change yourself. And the process of being a volunteer is not just that one week. It's going out and having to fundraise. It's packing bags in Tesco on a Friday night, uh, maybe three or four times. And we've a lot of experience. We have, um, our charity has spent over $200 million on housing. And our volunteers have come up with every, every, 
every method conceivable to man on how to raise money. So if you just have a heart big enough to say, you know what, I'm going to try and be a volunteer with you, then we will show you ways of, of raising money. Um, on, on the business side, uh, I, I, I don't usually talk about business, I suppose just in the context of me trying to demonstrate my, my um, genuine affinity with this great, great city. Um, I, I, I came here 10, I can't remember the exact year, 10 or 11 years ago and, um, and in a discussion I think with the city manager at that time, he was telling me about, and most of you may not be aware of this great rivalry between Swansea and Cardiff, um, but it was explained to me in a positive way and, and, and it was said to me that, you know what, if we could get the tallest building ever built in Wales here in Swansea, that would be a real icon and, and would demonstrate to people who don't know our city that this is a happening place. So I am... Um, under my developer hat, um, I, I, I made the tower possible. I built the, the tower there here in, in, in Swansea. Um, so my tallest building that I've built is, is, is um, Meridian Quay. Um, the widest building I've ever built was one in Glasgow. That was, used to be the Player Wheels cigarette factory and they produced uh, 200 million cigarettes a week there for 50 years. So it's only right that they should have wanted to do something good with the building when they left. And uh, it was in an area called Deniston, which was high unemployment. And uh, I, in the late 90s, I rebuilt that building and, um, and I had a very simple approach to it. Um, and, and, and downtown Glasgow was 25 pound a foot to rent offices. And we were maybe a mile or two out from the city centre. And, and what I wanted to do was provide a grade A luxury office suite for only 12.50 a foot, half the market rate, if people could overcome the hurdle of coming into a previously um, a, a poor working class area where there isn't uh, an office community in that area, um, and um, uh, so it it it, uh, it 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 ended up becoming very successful, and and um, I think it won one of the best urban regeneration awards in, in the UK. And my most special building is not the tallest one, not the widest one, but the smallest one. Uh, um, that so many of us in our, in our journey throughout lives were conditioned in the culture we all live in to have a bigger house, have a bigger car and, and keep pushing, pushing. But for me, you know, if I look back on 25 years of all types of uh, business successes, what means the most to me is, is that house. Um, uh, some of you will have been at school, I'm sure, when the banks collapsed in 2007, and, uh, and that is, I, I can't remember exactly why we've that slide in there, but I suppose to m maybe de demonstrate a bit of entrepreneur resilience, my own businesses were badly hit by the banks collapsing, and, and I had to dig deep to stay the course on my charity, and, um, and I respect all of you for having studied so hard to get where you are. And already I'm talking to similar people who know how to stay the course and put the effort in when needed. Um, to, 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 to keep my charity going and manage this crazy life, I do a couple of hundred flights a year. I, I sleep one to two nights a week, a couple of weeks of the month on, on, the, on the long hauls overnight. Um, I never think 40 hours a week. I think it's actually an obstacle. You know, I just think seven days, 168 hours, and, and I work, work a schedule around that. When you're working a really intensive workload schedule of huge travel and everything, um, managing your health is very important and your fit it took me a while to realize that, you know, I, I, um, uh, but certainly the last five or six years I'm very focused on maintaining a health regime that makes it a bit easier to keep up this crazy travel schedule. Um, Crisis managing is important. How do you manage in a crisis? Um, I dealt with four banks in Ireland. They were all worth 20 billion plus. All four went bust. So, so the chances of that happening were unknowns. Two of the banks were over 100 years old. And, and, and I was left with uh, numerous problems. So what you do with a situation that is truly overwhelming, Firstly, say to yourself, nothing is overwhelming if you just break down the blocks and separate out your targets 
and, and, and that's what I did. I wrote down what I wanted to achieve. I knew I had five or six really hard years ahead of me. Um, most important to all of us is our family and if you're lucky, kids and, and, and the rest of it. Um, NAMA was a state agency and, and I had 300 firms that I had to pay. That has taken me five years, and, um, but I've achieved my target. And charity, I, I had to weigh up when the banks collapsed. Do I just close it up now and come back in several years? So I had to give that a bit of thought and again I reached my simple decision. I'm going to do it, I'm going to try and do it and stay committed to it. I had housed, we had housed 50,000 at that time. I had set a target of 100,000 and I said no matter what challenges I have to deal with, I'm going to at least, even if I fail doing it, I'm going to try and hit that target of 100,000. Irish insolvent banks and, and again must also develop new business you know you're, you're, it's not, this was a hard thing to do but no matter what if you're you, you must always have a series well, for me anyway a series of goals and nothing stops you should stop you achieving um, your target to achieve those goals so for me to achieve these targets I knew I had to start some more businesses that would enable me perhaps to pay these 300 firms I had an easy choice. I could have declared bankrupt in the UK. I would have been out of all of my headaches in 12 months. And in truth, there's probably been many nights where, you know, I've often thought, should I or shouldn't I? But long and short, I, I didn't. And I think it's all worked out for the right reason. Um, now I'm only going to give you two minutes on personal development, but <coughs> I think, again, I've, I've covered a lot of this already. But, but, but I think understand what is personal development and what is personal goals. Too many people get preoccupied with material things. Now I, I enjoy a nice car, a nice house and the rest of it, but not at the exclusion of trying to broaden my experiences and develop my overall self. And, and I probably would break it down into those categories, family, job, house and friends and lifestyle. Um, I see comfort zone as the big enemy to all of our progress because all of us at some level are inside a comfort zone. You will be much more successful the more you can push yourself to get outside of your comfort zone, even to go and do something, even if perhaps the most selfish person in this room says, you know what, I'm not remotely interested in that charity. Test yourself, go on it for a week next year or a few days and actually come back and see how it does change you. So sometimes if you're very secure in your thinking, you know, I would again challenge you to challenge your thinking by, by, by an experience that doesn't sit comfortably with you. <coughs> I'm only 25 years in business. I think you need to be 50 years in business to really have nailed what are the key things to success. But these are just what have, what have worked for me. Um, I'm, I'm uh, extremely disciplined on my goals. I mightn't always hit them, but every single January I sit down, look at my goals for the year, and I divide them into business goals, personal goals, even relationship goals. And again, I stress I mightn't always hit them, but I, but I at least aspire to hitting them. That gives me a shape to me as a person and, and my life. I would encourage you to treat this really seriously. If, I hope you've made several friendships during your time in college. And I would encourage you to, you know, aside from the joking and the bit of banter that would go on amongst you when you talk about your goals, is to develop a tight circle where you can have some formal peer reviews. I have benefited by the counsel of some of my friends for many years. And they sit down and they know my strengths and weaknesses and they said, no, you're doing too much in this and that. So I would encourage you to try and get, um, build a, a peer group, a handful of people who really will be sincere and you can reciprocate that back to them. Negotiation is a funny one that often gets overlooked. It doesn't matter if you're the shyest person in the room or the loudest, whether you're back office in the future or front of office, every person here is, needs to have negotiation high on your list of, of um, constant skills to improve. It could be for some of you once a year where your manager comes down to you to review your salary. And then you find in that few seconds you've accepted 2,000 instead of the 8,000 that you've been dreaming of talking to him about that you're worth. And, and you need to look at the, the different tools that can help you to negotiate. And, and, and there isn't time today to go into all of them, but, but um, uh, comfort zone we discussed, be resilient, and I'm, I'm certain all of you already are resilient. Um, network with a defined purpose. I constantly meet young people 
who don't always understand really always what networking is. When we're invited to a function, when we're invited to a group of people, it can be so enjoyable. You can forget your purpose for being there and why you're there. So I usually say to people, most cases it's if you're going to anything, you should understand it's for financial and business advancement. Financial may mean perhaps one of you have a great idea and that person has a lot of money and if the two of you connect together, he might give money for your idea. And for other people who I'm certain there's a number of entrepreneurs in this room already, it's about making business contacts and understanding it. Um, uh, and the simple one that I'm sure again you all know already, experience, experience and more experience. Um, I've turned over in my businesses, I'm not sure fully, but say a billion euro or something like that. And, and, and yet this week was another example which I really enjoy where I can go back to my own wife and tell her this was one of the most incredibly interesting um, few days I've ever spent, you know, and, and, and I'm still doing that at 47. So, you know, keep experience and, and force yourself to, to get more experience. For those of you who, who go into a job, it would be my view that 90% of you uh, within three years should probably consider moving to another job, you know, because you will, you know, you, you'll make progress. Now, not for everybody. I know some good people have been 20 years in their first job, but statistically, and I've looked at it a little bit, there's, there's grounds to support um, not getting too comfortable in that very first job. Um, I think in, in, in conclusion, um, Today is about um, trying to make some of you a bit more aware of volunteers. And when you leave this room, you are now an influencer. You're either going to be neutral about what I said, you're going to be negative, and maybe some of you will say, you know what, there's something in that. I need you, as, as, as your dean has said, I need you to talk to other people and say, look, that guy's done a crazy mission in housing. It did work. He housed 125,000 people. The college are really getting behind this program. And look, why don't a few of us consider going out there? And maybe together, if you're too lacking confidence to fundraise yourself, maybe just say to a few of your friends, look, will three or four of us do this together? And, and we'll all raise, instead of raising X, let's pool it by four and do it together. And, and, and just imagine in a year's time, try and even think how you'll come back after that week. I can guarantee you that it's, it's a tough week. Um, you'll come home tired and bruised and exhausted, but full of a pride that will never leave you. Nelson Mandela, in 2007, I went to meet him, and I said to him, this was the, I'm, I'm not coming to see you anymore, Madiba. You should be out gardening and enjoying yourself. And, and I'm so grateful for all the support you've given me for several years, but I'm just letting you know I'm not coming again to, to see you. And Mandela reached across the table and held my hand and said to me, now, just remember one thing, Everything you want to do in life is possible through the power of the collective, the collective effort of people. So thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.